start a new teaching, and it seems a little weird, I'll admit, right off the bat, to, uh, to do it. What we're going to do is we're doing something called unmasking the devil. <laughs> and somebody once, when we were doing this, is like, that's the perfect topic, Pastor Ben, because you know my mother-in-law, don't you? I'm like, no. Or, or how many of you ever thought, man, the devil's in my children? <laughs> that was my parents. You know, we say those things kind of in jest. And uh, listen, if you think your mother-in-law is the devil or your mother's the devil, you have got some eye-opening coming. Um, listen, I, I'd rather not talk about the devil in church ever. It's not something that I like. If I were to be honest, I'd rather just avoid it altogether. I don't like talking about it. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me nervous. But I think it's a mistake if we never talk about the devil in church. And, and I want you to understand from the start for the next three weeks, this is not some sort of devil glorifying teaching. This is not about trying to scare the hell out of you and to scare you into something or to change your behavior because if not, the devil's going to get you. That's not what this is about. What we're trying to do is to better understand who the devil is according to scripture and tradition and experience and reason so that we know how to be able to live in light of all of that. So that's our our aim for today and the next two weeks afterwards. In your program, there's a study guide that will take you deeper into this study this week if you use it. And grab a Bible from this place if you need one. There's some at the front of the stage. There's also some, I think, by, by the back door. Um, there, use that study guide. There's a place to take some notes, but, but use those things in, in your study. Now, I want to start with this. You've probably seen different images of the devil on TV or cartoons, and, and often, you know, it kind of is this cute little one in cartoons, or, you know, the, the devil in, in red tights, right, with horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork. You ever seen an image kind of like this? A lot of times it's accompanied with like the angel on the other side, right? The devil is trying to convince you to do fun stuff. Well, the angels try to convince you to behave. And so that's kind of an image that we get from the devil. It's, and that image, actually, you need to know, is a combination of things. Those, those qualities actually come from some Greek gods um, around the devil, uh, Pan and Hades, but mixed in with a little bit of what we have in the book of Revelation that describes the beast. And, but listen, making the devil cartoonish and, and uh, palatable on TV or movies, it, it, listen, it, it's not a joke. Uh, the devil is not a joke. But you also need to do this. Um, some of us are tempted to, to look at the devil and make it the devil some super powerful entity in this world, something that is equal to God. But you need to know that, that that's not biblical either. God is the one that is all powerful and all knowing and, and all present. And there's no indication at all from the Bible that the devil is any of those things. The devil is depicted as a defeated being that that has had damage done, but that he's still powerful, that he still has influence, that he still likes to mess with things. But listen, you need to know that the devil's not everywhere. I've had people often tell me, man, the devil's really after me this week. The devil's really working on me. They're harassing me or tempting me and, and working on me. And since I have the inner gift of sarcasm, at times I'm like, whoo, Thank goodness, because I know that the devil's not everywhere, and if he's messing with you, then I'm I'm free, right? We just got to understand that. The devil isn't everywhere. While God knows our thoughts, we know the devil doesn't. He's not a mind reader. God is all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere, and the devil, we just need to acknowledge, is not those things. Now, a, a lot of the ideas we get behind who the devil is isn't actually come from Scripture, Uh, I would doubt very many people have actually done an in-depth scriptural study on the devil, but our our popular ideas come more from a 17th century writer um, who wrote Paradise Lost, John Milton. And in this, it was a a story that he wrote, a a long poem that he wrote that depicts Satan as this charismatic uh, figure that that is there to to work alongside some demons that that are there with them to kind of get people to go to hell. And and that idea, while based a little bit in Scripture, Milton actually is the work of his imagination with just a little bit from the Bible. Now, the idea that the devil is a fallen angel comes from the Old (laughs) Testament. Um, The books of Ezekiel and Isaiah talk about that. Uh, But most biblical scholars, when they go into those two verses, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, actually challenged that most likely who they were writing about were actually the kings of Babylon and Assyria of that day. The kings that claimed they were God. Um, 
but we get an idea of a fallen angel. There are several places in the Old Testament where Satan is depicted as an accuser. It's like the district attorney who is there to prosecute you, to accuse you of some sort of crime. And we see this in the Old Testament. Satan plays it in specific roles in the book of Job. He he accuses people like Joshua, the high priest. We see those images in the Old Testament. Now, while I'd like to ignore uh, the devil altogether, I can't because Jesus actually talks about the devil as well. And Jesus talks about him and calls him a murderer and a liar and a thief and And what you see in Jesus' story is right after he's baptized, he goes out in the wilderness to begin his ministry. And we're told that in the wilderness, he's met with temptation from the devil. The devil tries to to upend his mission and have him take a shortcut. It's an interesting interaction when you get into it. Now, just so you know, there's only 25 passages in your Bible that mention the devil or Satan. So we don't have a lot to go on. But the witness of Scripture is this, that the devil is defeated. The devil can tempt you, though, uh, but it doesn't control you. It doesn't take your will. The devil can accuse you and try to deceive you. But what we know is God has given us everything we need to avoid those traps. And so obsessing about the devil is dangerous, and so is ignoring them altogether. One of my favorite quotes comes from an author, C.S. Lewis. You may know of him. Um, He's an English writer, very deep thinker a theologian, and this is what he writes. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, into which humans can fall about the devils. He talks about them in multiple. He says, one is to disbelieve in their existence at all, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. He says, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors. And I like the way he's thinking. He says, the, the two biggest things you could do is say that they don't exist. And the other biggest mistake you can make is to obsess over them. Both of those are dangerous. So today, we're going to talk about the devil in one way. Um, what we're going to do over the next few weeks is talk about the devil from the characteristics that we see of him in Scripture. And today, we're going to talk about him as a deceiver. Because Satan is the deceiver who attacks your minds with lies, especially with lies about God's truth. Next week, I'm going to talk about how he's the accuser, that he attacks your heart with accusations, and, and then how he destroys your lives the, the last week. I know that feels like a feel-good message, right? Trust me, there's good news in all of this. But we have to just acknowledge who it is who he is and how he works. And today, it's about the deceiver. And we really, we get this from Jesus Uh, Jesus says this about Satan in John chapter 8. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, and he always hated the truth. There's no truth in him. And when when he lies, he is consistent with his character, for he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. I think that's pretty clear. What does Jesus think of him? He's a liar. And you get a good picture of this right from the very beginning of the Bible. When you get into the creation story and you see Adam and Eve and their interaction in paradise, you start to understand that Satan is a liar. And how he begins in this one is he actually lies to them by by making them think that uh, God's word is not what he said it was. That's one of the ways he'll mess with you the most. He makes you question what God is saying or what God has said. In the creation story, there's Adam and there's Eve. And they're in paradise, and it's awesome, and it says they're naked, and they don't care, and they feel great about everything, and, and God has set them there. and says they can have everything in the garden except for just one thing. And then what we see is the serpent, uh, the deceiver. Satan comes in in this image as a snake, and it says this. The deceiver says, did God really say that you must not eat of any of the fruit of the garden? Did you hear what he did? He started to distort God's word. God said, you can eat of anything except for this one. And here comes the deceiver. Did God say you can't eat of anything? And that's what the deceiver does. As he puts doubts in your mind. Do you really believe God said that? Do do you really believe that uh, God meant that for you? I mean, come on. You're smart enough, right? I mean, God may have said that for them back then, but to you, it's, it's different now. In fact, God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he really just, just wants you to be happy and to do what makes you feel good. That's how the deceiver works. He, he twists God, he, he messes with God's word and he, and he twists it as well. Not just to make you doubt it, but, but to take his word and make you think differently about it. Eve tells the snake, she actually corrects him. You know, God actually said, we can eat of everything but this one fruit, and if we do, we'll die. But then the serpent goes, wait a minute, 
<laughs> you won't die. He's saying, God knows. He's twisting his words here. God just knows that if you eat it, that you're going to be like God. That's what he says. And I think it's interesting because, you know, he could have easily messed with Eve in so many different ways to try to mess with her and lie to her. He could have said things like, you know what? Adam really doesn't like you right now. <laughs> he, he really doesn't. Um, in fact, he, he, you know, he's tired of talking all the time. He wants to go to his cave, like literally, and stay there. Uh, Adam wants his rib back. <laughs> Adam thinks you're fat. You know, he could have done anything to mess with her, but what he did instead was to take God's word and to twist it. Did God really say that? No, God just, God just knows that if you do it, then you're going to be like God, which I also think is interesting because I think that's kind of what the devil wants to be, is a God. It's like, no, God, God doesn't mean that for you. That's how deception works. He, he twists his word. In this one, it's like he's saying, God is holding out on you, Eve. God's just this big party pooper. God doesn't want you to have fun. He doesn't want you to know what he knows. Listen, God sets limits on you, and if God loved you, he wouldn't do that. Listen, the devil wants to convince you and me that, that if we follow God, we're going to miss out on all the fun. But the truth is, when we actually obey God, and we start to know what he wants for our lives, and sets parameters, and we follow that, there's actually a lot more freedom in that. Yeah, disobedience happens. I can't speak for you. Disobedience happens here. And when that happens, I mean, there's consequences to pay, but, but it's not about the one thing we can't do. It's, it's about so much more. And that's what the devil does. He deceives us. And usually he picks the one thing or the two things you can't do. You know, the forbidden fruit, as we call it. You know, you can't do this. You can't do that. Rather than all the things you can do. You know, oh, you're a Christian now, so you, you can't. Uh, get drunk and, and you can't make fun of people and, and you can't cuss and chew and hang out with the girls that do. Is that what they say? You know, listen, God has set a few prohibitions on us. Why? Not because we'll miss out. Because when we do certain things, lie, cheat, steal, murder, adultery, you know what that does? It destroys you. And it destroys families and it destroys relationships and cities and worlds. That's why. It's not to miss out on all the fun. It's actually to give you a tremendous amount of freedom. You, you follow those and you'll find freedom in life. And, 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 and Satan likes to take the one thing you can't do and beat you over the head with it. That's his tactic. He twists God's world, word. And every time he does and we fall for it, there's brokenness. Brokenness in relationships. Brokenness in families. In cities. In schools. In churches. Yeah. You know, Satan can actually talk here. Yeah, there's brokenness. And every time there's brokenness, inevitably what happens is we feel shame and we feel embarrassment. But you know what we tend to do is we then tend to blame somebody else. We get that from the story as well with Adam and Eve. God comes to find them and they're hiding because they're afraid and they're ashamed. And he's like, well, Adam, what have you done? And you know what Adam does? He says, well, this woman you gave me did it. Yeah, way to be chivalrous there, Adam. And she's like, well, it wasn't me. It was the devil who made me do it. They even start to blame God. That's what happens when we fall for these lies and we accept them is, is embarrassment and shame happens and then blame happens. Again, that story, it's your story, isn't it? Oh, wait, it, it's my story. Listen, we cannot blame other people when we fall for the lies. We can't blame God. And, and honestly, I don't think we can blame the devil. Yeah, he gives us ideas, but we have to own our own choices in all of this. And, and sometimes I think the biggest way that the devil deceives us, or, or at least me, is by that subtle thing about God's word where, where he says, you know what? God really just wants you to be happy. God loves you so much, Ben. He wants you to be happy, and, and he wants you to be safe. And he wants you to be comfortable. But listen, those are some of the biggest lies that we accept. God doesn't really care as much about your happiness as he does about your holiness. God doesn't care as much about your safety and your comfort than he does about you following him. And I know this is true because Jesus says to actually follow him, here are some things. He says, if you want to be my disciple, then you have to pick up your cross and follow me. I mean, you got to pick up the very thing that might very well kill you and follow him. He says this, if uh, you want to follow me, if you want to save your life, then you have to lose it. He says there's no greater love than to give your life up for somebody. 
He actually tells us that in the world, you will suffer. Does that sound like somebody that says you just need to be happy? He says, no, you'll suffer, but take heart, because even if you suffer, I've already overcome it all for you. That's what he says. He says, to follow me, you've got to love your enemies. That doesn't sound like happiness. He says, pray for those who persecute you. He says, to follow Jesus is not about happiness and safety and comfort. It's quite the opposite. You see, the scripture calls us to do things. If you follow Jesus, Jesus calls you to be a voice for people that don't have one. And I'm not talking the ones who are mute. I'm talking about the people that have no voice in society, the people who are outcast. We are not supposed to stand idly by when we have a lot and people have little. We're to defend widows and orphans and the sick and, and the outcast and the, the stranger. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And none of those things is about our safety and our comfort and our happiness. It just isn't. And listen, if the devil has got you deceived and all wrapped up to where you think that life is all about being happy, then I want you today to call it for what it is. It's a lie, right? It's a lie. From where? From the father of lies. Just name it. Now, I feel like I'm beating you up. (laughs) It's like, where's the good news in this? And I want to start to shift and share with you some good news here. Because just as Jesus calls the devil the father of lies, Jesus calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. There's this contrast here. Lies versus truth. And and, and in the truth, there's forgiveness, and there's freedom, and there's life, and there's salvation. There's those things. But when we give in to the father of lies, we don't see it. When you accept Jesus and start to follow the truth, it's like all of a sudden, your ownership is transfer, transferred. It's like all of a sudden, you who play defensive end for the Kansas City Chiefs have all of a sudden been let go to go to the promised land of the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> and next September 9th, when the Chiefs are stinking it up, you can say to yourself, thank God I belong on a different team. Okay, I had to get my Chiefs thing in there. But you get the idea, right? You, you become part of the father of truth. So whenever those lies start to show up and the father of lies is pushing on you, you just simply say, guess what? I don't belong to your team no more. I belong to the team of truth. Listen, Jesus has set us free from things, from shame and from guilt. It tells us in Scripture that Jesus didn't come to condemn you, but to save you and to set you free. And that's what the truth is. We're free. But you also have to acknowledge that, yeah, Satan's still out there. Satan's like that boxer who has just about been knocked out, and and he is desperate. And every boxer who is desperate and about to go down, they just start flailing like crazy. Why? Why? Because they know all it takes is for you to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and one hand to hit you and you're out. Yeah, Satan's about to feed it, but he's still dangerous. And so we've got to be careful around that. In Scripture, there's some things that can help us overcome the liar, to, to be on guard against the liar. And it, it starts with the, with the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians. And he tells us this, to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, the devil's tactics, and the full armor of God. And he's talking about military terms. Back then, uh, there was much more hand-to-hand combat than there is now. I mean, now in wars, you can actually kill somebody with a joystick here. And it go- At any rate, over there, it's more hand-to-hand, so they had armor. People then understood what armor was all about. And so he starts to explain it in armor terms, like the breastplate of righteousness, he said. And righteousness, it's a Bible word. Is a church word. It just simply means being right with God. He says, protect yourself by being right with God. Follow Jesus, because when you follow Jesus, it brings you into the right relationship with God. Um, James, who's the the half-brother of Jesus, says this, that we need to resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And then he says that if you come near to God, he will come near to you. That's about righteousness. That's about being right with God. And, And so, listen, when you fail and you fall and you mess up and you will, I guarantee it, when you do it, don't believe the lies that say you have to stay there. Get back up. Do what you can to be in a right, right relationship with God and others. So that, that is um, the breastplate of righteousness. And then he talks about the shoes of the gospel of peace. And this is one of my favorites because I'm a shoe guy. 
I got like over 30 pairs of shoes. Mm. I can't help it, man. They're like my addiction a little bit. Um, but here's the thing about shoes. I've yet to see anybody ever get up one day and, and put on shoes and socks and sit on the couch all day long, right? What are shoes made for? Or better yet, there's a song. What are these boots made for? Come on, ladies. These boots are made for walking, right? And that's just what they'll do. Shoes are meant to be moving around. So the shoes of the gospel of peace is, is for you to be moving around, sharing the gospel, talking to people about who Jesus is and learning about Jesus. It's, it's about keeping active and moving. If for any other reason, a moving target's hard to hit. Bob, we, right? That's what we're taught. So the shoes of the gospel of peace. He says to put on the shield of faith. And this is Paul telling us uh, to do this. In fact, he tells us that if you do this, it will extinguish, I love this imagery, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And faith is, is trust in what we can't see. It's trusting in God. It's trusting him even when everything seems like it's falling apart. It's trusting in what he said and what he's done. Faith is taking God on his promises that he'll always be with us. Even in the midst of a storm, he will guide us through it, that he will make it count, that he'll forgive us. So there's the shield of faith, and he says the helmet of salvation to protect our heads, is to protect our minds, so that we understand that, yes, we are free from the penalty of sin and, and shame and, and, and eternity. We, we've got to have that helmet of salvation. And then he goes and he talks about the sword of the Spirit, he says, which is the Word of God. And just one thing to point out, this is the only thing he talks about that's an offensive weapon. Not like offensive, like you offend me, but like offensive instead of defensive. This is the only thing we have to actually attack with. And he says it's the word of God. It's, it's knowing what the scriptures say. It's getting into the Bible and doing devotion. It's getting to understand Christian teachings so that, that anytime we are attacked, we have some words to actually go at them with. When, when the liar tells you that you are worthless, then you remember that God says, you are my beloved child and in you I am pleased. Yeah, it's the word of God. And then since we're talking about the liar, he tells us to put on the belt of truth which means you've got to have a foundation of truth in your life, which means getting into devotionals and reading and, and, and going to church and hearing from preachers and teachers and getting in home groups or small groups or youth groups and getting to understand the truth that is out there to equip yourself with the truth. Man, it, it, can, have, it can defend you from Satan's lies every single time. So listen, as Christians, you don't need to be afraid of evil. You don't need to be afraid of Satan. In fact, what we see throughout Scripture and our tradition is this, that, that he has more to be afraid from us than we do from him. We're called to advance God's word. In fact, Paul wrote this. He said, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world, meaning you're not going to fight the devil with an AK-47. <laughs> no, you're going to, on the contrary, you have the divine power to demolish strongholds. You have a divine power. Did you know that? You accept Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes. You have a divine power. And you get into some prayer with that and, 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 and take some action. You have the ability to do incredible things. Jesus um, had prayer. It went held hand in hand with what he did. He healed people. He cast out demons. And then here's what he did. He commissioned his followers. And he said that if you follow me, guess what? You have the same power I do. So go on the offensive. But here's the thing, just so we wrap up. Just remember that there are not two equal forces in this world. There's not good and evil and they are equal. No, that is not true. God is the creator of the universe. The God who created you and your mother. And all there is. Satan's a part of that. And Satan's a part that rebelled and that broke away. It's a broken part of it. But, but he's still, you know... He's still dangerous, but in the end, we know he's ultimately defeated. He's ultimately wiped out, and we know that. So when you leave, don't, don't spend your time worrying about the devil. Let's not spend a lot of our time running from the devil. Take an offense. Take an offensive stand. Get to know the truth. Get to know the truth. 
of the truth. May you allow God some room in your life today and this week to let his spirit lead you. His way, his truth, his life. May you, may you let him encourage you and empower you. May you let him forgive you when you fail. May you remember that you have switched teams. May you follow Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Let's end up in prayer. God, the reality is, is there's so many things that lie to us. God, for some of us, we have a hard time believing that there's any good within us. God, I've spent times in my life that I, I've thought, what's the point? And for those of us that way, help us to know your truth, that, that you made us and that you love us. That there's nothing we can do that would separate us from your love, that help us to see past the lies that we've accepted, to turn, to have faith, to have trust. Come, Holy Spirit, and empower us with faith, salvation. I'd help us to be men and women that are very different because we spent time in worship with you today. Come, Holy Spirit, encourage us. Tell us the truth, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. It's in his name that we worship and that we pray. Amen.